Hello and welcome to this new edition of Roads Ahead, our showcase of thought leadership in the roads community. I'm Elizabeth Keish, the warden and CEO, and I am really excited today to have our first cross-generational Roads Ahead conversation. It's, you know, we really are uh, seeing so many beautiful examples across the Rhodes community of collaboration across Rhodes scholars from different generations. But this is one of the most exciting ones. And so I am really honored and delighted to have with us today Professor Sandy Fredman, who is South Africa at large and Wadham, uh, 1979, so one of the early, earliest classes of women Rhodes scholars, and Nomfundo Ramalekana, who is also South Africa at large and Lady Margaret Hall, 2015. And so uh, Sandy is the Rhodes Professor of uh, Commonwealth and US Law. You're, I know you're a member of the British Academy. You're a barrister. I think you're on the Queen's Advisory Board of, uh, uh, on, on legal matters. So uh, a very distinguished uh, Rhodes Scholar who is a member of the, uh, of the Oxford uh, community here. Uh, and in 2012, uh, Sandy, you created this very innovative and exciting project called the Oxford Human Rights Hub, which has involved quite a few Rhodes Scholars, including Numfundo. So first, I want to ask you about the, the Human Rights Hub. How did it come about? Uh, you know, what, what makes it distinctive? Yes, so uh, when I was appointed to this chair in 2012, I was asked to put forward a vision, and my vision was that we could create a global community of human rights scholars, practitioners, and uh, policy makers across the globe, where we could make best use of the internet, and also we could share our very rich resources here in Oxford by creating Oxford as the hub, and all our spokes radiating out over the world, where we could have fruitful collaborations with people whose voices are not often heard, mm. with uh, others who, who would, could share their best practice in human rights. And so we created the Oxford Human Rights Hub, which um, is centered in Oxford, but through our website, we reach out to many parts of the world mm. in order to share best practice of human rights and in that way, to improve everybody's ability to use human rights. So we, every day we publish a blog on cutting edge new human rights law development somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And what's distinctive about our blog is that it's actually written by contributors from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Each of these contributors is themselves an expert in their own community, um, but we edit it in Oxford through our student editors, of whom Lumfundo was one of our really great editors for two years. Two years, yeah. And um, so we edit it to a high standard. It has to be 700 words and no more. Mm. We spend, and Lumfundo can talk a bit more about the editorial experience, but we have a whole range of uh, contributors from most junior to very senior, such as um, special UN special rapporteurs, mm. senior lawyers, professors, but also new career academics. Mm -hmm. Even we had a whole swathe from undergraduates in various Indian universities. Oh, that's wonderful. We, we have contributors from so many different countries in the world. But what's really exciting about the blog is that it's an organic way of creating comparative human rights law. Mm. So these themes just develop organically one of which could be sexual orientation, mm -hmm. same-sex marriage. We've got various uh, contributions from all over the world about all the different developments as they happen, um, and so on. So that's our blog. Do you want to carry on? <laughs> sure. <laughs> we, uh, what we also try and do is use all different kinds of media. Mm. So we don't only use the blog, we also use, we have podcasts. So podcasts are um, actually set up and organized by another of our road scholars, Kira Allman, who is our communications director. Um, they're about 20 minutes, they're an interview with a human rights practitioner or somebody very senior in human rights. For about 20 minutes, she interviews them and um, puts it up as a podcast. So very recently we had Philip 
Alston, mm. who's the um, UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty. He came to the UK, uh, created quite a lot of publicity around his report. Mm. And so his is one of our many podcasts. We also had one of our my previous doctoral students who's gone back to India now, Anup Surendranath, mm -hmm. who runs a big project on capital punishment in India. Mm. We had a whole series on sustainable development goals. And we find these podcasts are very popular for people who don't really want to sit and read. You can listen to them while you're walking down the street or washing dishes in the gym. So they are very popular. Um, the other thing we've, we've beginning to do more and more is to create um, short courses or video documentaries about specific subjects. Mm. We did one called Learning for Litigators, mm. which was about strategic litigation around the right to education. Mm. And the idea was to share best practice for litigators from all over the world who are doing cutting edge strategic litigation around the right to education. And Numfunda was involved in that as yeah. well. In fact, quite a lot of our Rhodes Scholars were involved. And we created a series where we shared best practice of litigators from New York, South Africa, Brazil and India. And the idea there is to improve everybody's ability to access best practice. And our current one is on reproductive rights for women. Um, as we know, the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 have promised that by 2030 there will be universal reproductive health rights for all women and girls everywhere. And we didn't want that promise to go unfulfilled. So this documentary is about how you use human rights to achieve change, to make sure that states are held accountable for those promises. And we're working together with the World Health Organization and the Office of High Commission of Human Rights. And one of our previous Rhodes Scholars, Vicky Mayandazi, has been very instrumental in helping us develop this, the, the part of the project in Nairobi in Kenya. She's from Kenya, as you know. Um, and that project is, is ongoing now. And our fourth thing that we're very pleased that we, we launched last year was an academic journal, which we called the University of Oxford Human Rights Hub Journal. And it's free online, mm -hmm. um, free access, but peer-reviewed and very high quality. Because we realized that, first of all, many um, people from all over the world are, are, are unable to access journals which are behind paywalls. But also, there are not very many places where uh, authors from the Global South can publish. Mm -hmm. So we are very keen to create a platform where there is uh, a cross-collaboration, cross-fertilization from Global South and Global North. Uh, so that's... Wow, okay. it's, very, it's very exciting. And I have to say, I, I, I uh, don't know, Sandy, whether I've shared this with you, but when I was a scholar in the 80s, I collaborated with two other Rhodes Scholars, Benedict Kingsbury from New Zealand and Craig Scott from Canada, and uh, organized a conference on third generation human rights. And Philip Alston was one of our speakers. Right. So, but it was, there was nothing here in Oxford that, uh, that was, you know, pulling people together and bridging theory and practice in this incredibly exciting way and that in which the hub is doing. And I especially am so impressed with the ways in which this is a truly global enterprise. So Numfundo, I'd love to hear from you, kind of what drew you initially to the hub? What's your, what's the work been like? Yeah. Uh, what are, you know, what's, what are you most excited about? Um, I think for me, so I work as a blog editor for the hub, mm -hmm. and um, I did this for about two years, and it's allowing sort of, or creating a space where people working in sort of very different environments and facing very different social, political, economic sort of barriers to the realization of rights and finding out what are the strategies they're using for resistance through the law, adjacent to the law and mm -hmm. giving them a platform to share these ways of resistance. If not a platform to share how they're resisting, but maybe to share like their struggles, mm. right? So we have mm. actual blogs where people are talking about legal impediments to realizing rights. So blogs mm. like that where people are really putting on the global stage what's happening in their jurisdictions mm -hmm. and sort of creating relationships, right? So you have blogs where 
um, you can connect sort of a, a writer to somebody who's written something similar from a different jurisdiction in, in, in a way that they might sort of see a different way to tackle a problem. Yes. And, and that's been really great. The other really amazing aspect of it has been giving, and, and I've worked a lot of this, giving sort of people working in jurisdictions where these kind of problems don't even exist, a way to communicate and also to learn how to write, how to, commu- how to, how to sort of talk about human rights in, in a specific way. So my favorite part has been working with um, undergraduates who mm-hmm. write for the Hub and seeing a blog go from its first draft to its very last draft and allowing young sort of human rights scholars mm. to think critically about the law, to think about ways to use the law to create change. Um, my favorite one is recently, uh, I edited a blog about a year ago and the scholar from India, Ayushi Argaval, she's now currently, in, the, in she just finished the BCL program and to be able to see her, to see how her ideas about a specific issue have sort of developed over time mm. and even the work that she's going back to do now in India quite aligned with the initial blog that she'd written. So really the work is, is beyond just sort of creating a space where the information is housed It's about creating sort of relationships um, at a global scale for doing this work of like really affirming the humanity of all people and and using this one tool, which is law, to do that. it's incredibly powerful. Uh, that's uh, wonderful, and I, you know, I, I, you're a wonderful example of actually creating community through digital means. Uh, so, so now, uh, tell us, Numfundo, are you? Uh, I should know this, uh, but are are you working on a DFIL in law? Is yes. that yes? yes so, what? It, how, how does this connect with the work that you're doing in your in your DFIL? So, I'm doing a DFIL in law. I work on affirmative action in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, so. My, so my work is comparative, so I'm, I'm looking at sort of South Africa, but from what lessons we can learn from India, the United States, as well as Canada. Mm. So, so the hub has been a place where I get sort of resources in relation to my own work, but it's also been a place where I get to explore ideas mm. about my work. So really showing the value of comparative methodology, but also comparative struggle. Right? Mm-hmm. When you start seeing the ways in which dealing with um, the history of racial injustice in South Africa and the strategies that have been used in India to deal with sort of caste discrimination um, as well as strategies in the United States dealing with sort of the history of slavery in Canada, the position of Aboriginal communities and how the law, even if it's different, even the social and political contexts are different, um, is sort of being used by these different communities to achieve a common goal, and that is sort of achieving equality. And I think what I love about the work that Sandy does and the work we do at the Hub is really sort of revealing to the world how common the struggle is mm-hmm. and how it's, it's, it's this one thing of like finding, sort of affirming the dignity of all people, affirming the sort of sanctity of life, and, and the law being one way to do this, and, and also showing that it's actually the same. What we yearn for as people is the same across all these different jurisdictions. Yes. So the, the blog and the hub and the community has been a source for that. So in, in one of the things about our community is that I, I'm from South Africa, so there is somebody else, Scott Mbatia, who is an Indian Rose scholar as well, who's a part of our community. He's now the managing editor of the hub. And Gotham is my sort of go-to when I'm, I'm reading something about India and I've, I'm, I, I'm lost. And he sort of provides that sort of space. So the hub is one place, but also just the community that we've created, yes. which is something that isn't present in Oxford, mm-hmm. um, and specifically in the legal sort mm-hmm. of world of Oxford, mm-hmm. um, sort of that very diverse um, space where sort of ideas develop. And, and so that's been a really big gift. Um, for anybody who's sort of in, in this area of law in Oxford. I love it. It must be so energizing yeah. to be uh, <laughs> uh, a part of these young scholar yeah. activists' it's uh, journeys. It's wonderful because uh, so part of the hub is actually also my research group, which is partly what Mum Fundo was talking about. Mm. And I'm uh, partly deliberately, but partly lucky. I've got a very diverse group, all working on similar themes, but from lots of different regions. So mm-hmm. as well as Nomfundo, you know Jody, who's from yes. Namibia, he's one of our Rhodes Scholars as well. He's working on the right to watch in Namibia. Mm-hmm. We have um, not, not just Gautam, but Rishika Sagal, mm-hmm. who's another Rhodes Scholar, who's working on India, and um, 
Corey and, Pillay. And Corey Pillay. Ah, yes. So, so they, they, they are working on there. We have um, Megan Campbell is Canadian, and so she brings that Canadian perspective. Um, and actually next year we're also having, for the first time, so it's, um, someone from Colombia coming to join us. So we, mm -hmm. will, we really do focus on the Global South, on having South-South conversation, South-North conversation. And this mm -hmm. creates a supportive community as well for, for all of our members. Yes. How has it shaped your own research agenda to, to have this amazing, diverse community around mm -hmm. you? Yes, it's been very, as you say, energizing. Mm -hmm. um, there are all these young scholars with huge ideas, um, great energy, and the big thing is that they're very mutually supportive. So what we mm -hmm. try and do is create a space where people can share their the parts of their work which they're unsure of, parts which they need input into. Mm -hmm. So. So that's been um, very energizing. And one of the things about the hub, we do also do convenings and we try to make sure that the doctoral students all get lots of opportunities to go both to, to different countries to present their work. Mumfunda came with us to India la yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, and, um, all of our scholars in one way or another have these opportunities uh, Gori Pele has been doing our work on reproductive rights, so she's just in this last six months been to Geneva, been to Nairobi, mm. and to Bangalore, um, and they all in one way or another get, get involved in things that we do, so that's been very energizing as well. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. So. As you, I, I, you know, you've, you've, you've touched on some of the major themes that the hub focuses on, uh, gender, certainly, reproductive rights, um, LGBT rights, uh, uh, poverty, the sustainable development goals. You know, as you think about how the world of human rights scholarship and activism has, has evolved over time, uh, you know, where do you see it going in the next, let's say, decade? So it's interesting that you talk about your conference on third generation rights. Yes. A lot of my work in the last decade, two decades, has been on socioeconomic rights, mm. social rights, and to, to break down the boundaries between traditional views of civil and political rights and socioeconomic rights. So to break down the boundaries between those generations of mm. rights. Mm. And one of the things about the hub and, and my work and Mfundo's work in the group is is really to see human rights as a force for energy. Mm. Um, and that's why bringing in social rights is challenging on lots of fronts. It's mm. challenging on the institution of the courts, mm. because how do courts deal with issues which have often been thought of as policy issues? It's challenging on the kind of things that Funda was talking about, whether you use courts or other methods to bring yes. about change. Mm. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work that's been done on that, and that uh, one of the big, a lot of work has already been done, but there's still a huge amount more to mm. be done. But I think you asked the question of going forward. Um, the, the sustainable development goals set up all these promises, but a key issue is how we can harness human rights mm. to that end so that the energy around the Sustainable Development Goals isn't lost on political polemic. That's been one of the big things that we've done, particularly around gender. Mm. As you know, the SDGs are claiming, promising mm -hmm. equality for all women and girls everywhere. And that's something as a human rights community, as both academics and practitioners, we need to hold them to account. So that's one of the key challenges, I think, going forward. Unfortunately, there are so many women in so many places who still don't have even the most basic rights. Yes. We had a blog yesterday or the day before about child marriage in mm. Iran. Mm. We don't often get people writing from Iran because it's not so easy. So we've been very pleased to be getting more blogs from the Middle Eastern region. And those kind of things remind us Mm -hmm. How much work there is still to be mm -hmm. done on gender equality yes. in so many different ways. Our reproductive rights project is showing how many women die in childbirth still. 
But it's a shocking figure considering that mm. we know that um, medical interventions can solve that problem. So it's really a political and a human rights issue. So going forward, I think the focus that we have in the hub on gender and poverty and social rights need to all come together to continue to develop how we continue to develop this interface between what we can do as academics to develop the concepts, how we can interact with people who are working on the ground mm. to make that a reality for them, and as well what we gain hugely from that interaction mm. so that the work we do academically is con continually informed by what people are experiencing on the ground, as Mankunda said. Yeah. Mm. I think that's, that's, that's the moment, right? So you have all these books coming out, Samuel Moyne's book, and people are being very critical about human rights, but the actual key is infusing human rights into the daily lives and practices of policymakers, of people working and in NGOs, of people working in sort of state infrastructure. How do we bring sort of the rights language, how do we bring, how do we merge rights with struggle movements, how do we merge rights with sort of the daily practices of bureaucratic institutions and that's sort of the work and I think what the blog does in allowing sort of um, people from different sort of fields, not just academics, to come together and talk about this is exposing those connections between policy and law but also between sort of struggles like popular struggle, activism and mm. law and that's sort of where we, we should be pushing for. So rather than jettison human rights, as sort of some people are arguing, we need to be finding ways to actually infuse it into like the infrastructure that's already there. Because as Sandy has said, we can write all about sort of how and critique human rights, but the re everyday struggles of like millions of people across the globe is that actually sometimes rights language is the only way in which people can communicate their struggle and their suffering. And we need to meet that where it is. Um. And, and empower them to use that, that tool. You know, my, my DFIL uh, title was uh, Rights as Instruments. So I have to tell you, this is incredibly inspiring to me. Um, and, the, and the community and the connections that you have built and the amazing uh, number of Rhodes Scholars. Do you know how, how many Rhodes Scholars have you, uh, have you worked with over the years? I, I have, you know, do you have a sense of that? Uh, <laughs> A lot. <laughs> I'd have to come. It would be quite a few. Yes. I'd have to come. Yes, I think at least. Yes. We'll have to. We'll have to. We'll have to. Yeah. We've got you, Nomfundo, Jordi, Rishika, Gori, and Gautam. That's already. And Vicky left. Hello. Helen left. She's from South Africa. Probably Hello. 20, maybe. It may well be 20. I mean, that's incredible, you know, and we talk about lifelong fellowship and, you know, Rhodes Scholars uh, learning from each other and working together to stand up for the world. And this is an incredibly uh, inspiring and beautiful example of that. So well, the wonderful thing is um, nobody leaves. Mm. When they leave Oxford, they don't leave our global community. Yes. They often go back, they become a regional correspondent, which are like our antenna on the ground. They continue to work on, on various different issues with us. They tell us about the, the work that they're doing. So it's, um, it's a very dynamic relationship. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to give another example about mm. the, the way Mumfunda was talking about kind of creating communities of solidarity. Um, Recently, the Kenyan court refused to strike down criminalization of sodomy, and one of the litigators wrote a piece on that. In, you know, it was obviously a very dark moment. Mm. But at the same time, the very next day, we could do another blog from, what, from Brazil, um, from a professor in Brazil who we've worked with a lot, talking about how they had made... Um, um, discriminatory speech against LGBTQI people into a hate crime. Mm. So there was a kind of positive side mm. for the, the Kenyan litigator yeah. could realize that in Brazil actually people were making gains. Yeah. And was it Botswana? We had Just a few days day, after. We yeah. had a blog from Botswana where they actually did strike down the sodomy law. Mm. So there's a sense there that you're not alone, that mm. you can learn from these other experiences and that people can put it all together.
yeah. and uh, keep up the morale. Mm. And, and one of the things that came from that is because in the hub that we have one of the litigators who worked on the Indian litigation a few years ago. So they got into a conversation with Kenny about like, what is the next step? So we went out for lunch and got, I mean, Kenny were talking about like, how do we, what is the next strategy? Once the court has said this, how do you appeal? What kind of arguments do you make an appeal? And that all just sprung up from the blog. And I know that right now there's sort of like collaboration on that and like actual legal arguments that can be imported into different jurisdictions coming from the experiences of um, where it's, it's sort of brought about transformative outcomes. Yes, yes. So bit by bit with persistence, yeah. with, with learning across this vast geography, um, it, it shows, you know, human rights work in action. So that's absolutely wonderful. Um, such inspiring work. So if somebody wants to find out more about the Hub or to get involved with the Hub, how, how can they best connect with so you? So they should first of all go to our website. Mm -hmm. uh, they can write us under email under Oxygen and Rights Hub. They can contact any of us directly. Um, we're, we've got a big presence on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, wherever there's a space for communication, they'll find us. So it's very easy to get in touch with us. That's terrific. And if you're in a jurisdiction that you feel isn't being covered on, yes. on, on the hub, please yes. just offer to write or maybe just send us an email and then we could sort of connect you with, or if you want to connect us with people that you know that would be able to write for the hub, are the human rights issues you think we aren't covering. I mean, that would be great and just to reach to those places where we aren't able to reach. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we're sending that out to the, the Rhodes community and uh, hopefully we'll get some, I know we'll get some great feedback on this very inspiring conversation. Well, but hopefully there'll be, yeah. Sorry, I just no. want to say that there are lots of different things you can do. You can mm. be an editor. Mm -hmm. You can, if, if you're interested in podcasting, if you, if you prefer the oral, you can be involved with that. We do, as I say, a lot of video work. If you want to do more academic, our journal is developing. We have editors on the journal. Um, if you want to organize a workshop or convening, we can, we can also talk about that. Actually, we are, uh, we are totally built out of imagination and energy. Mm. So everybody who comes who has an idea, we will think about making it happen. So that's what, how people should see it. And they Wonderful. To contact us. Built out of imagination and energy and with great love and commitment. Uh, thank you so much, Sandy and Nampundo, for bringing the Oxford Human Rights Hub and the Rhodes Intergenerational Global Fellowship to life. Thank you so much, and thank you all for joining us for this edition of Rhodes Ahead.